everyone, welcome to My Victory Church. We are one church in multiple locations. So let's welcome everyone that's joining us in Tabor, in Claire's home, in Okotoks, in Lloydminster, in Lethbridge, online. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to part two of the five love languages of God. Now, I grew up in, in church. You've, I've talked a lot of, you know, about my upbringing but I grew up, and when we talked about the topic that I'm going to be discussing uh, today, I, I, I heard multiple sermons, lots of sermons on this topic. But every sermon that I heard, and I'm thinking that there's probably a number of you that have heard the same, same type of messages that I heard, um, and, and probably the same pressure that I felt. But I heard multiple sermons talking about our relationship with God. And all of the sermons that I heard, I left feeling guilty. I left feeling like I wasn't doing enough. I left feeling like I should do more. And, and I'm talking about, you know, sermons on, you know, praying, sermons on reading the Bible, sermons on devotions. And whenever I, I heard messages on these, I always felt like, Man, I am not a good Christian. I am not doing a great job in my relationship with God. I have to do more. And I always left feeling ashamed, guilty, like I needed to do so much more. Well, today we're going to be talking about that very thing, about quantity time. And, and when I began preparing this series, preparing this, this message on quantity time, we started uh, quality time, I started uh, talking uh, and I started really focusing on this whole idea of spending time with God and the love languages of God. And it got me to thinking about, you know, the book, uh, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. Now, how, how many of you have read th that book, the, the Five Love Languages? Many, if you haven't, you've probably heard somebody talk about it. But just to go, just an overview again, Gary Chapman was doing so much counseling with married couples and they, he learned something in, in all the counseling that he was doing. He learned that there's a lot of times where we think we're communicating one thing to our spouse, but they're not picking up what we're laying down, right? We're, we're not, they're not receiving and understanding that we are trying to communicate love to them, but they're, it's like we're speaking a different language. And so he ended up writing this book, The Five Love Languages, because he began interviewing couples and discovered that there's five main ways that all of us communicate love to one another. Each one of us is a little bit different than, than everybody else. So the five love languages, again, let's just review it quickly, is the first one is words of affirmation. Words of affirmation are, you know, just, you know, con you know constantly, uh, you know, affirming and, and celebrating, catching our, our spouse doing something right, and, and so affirming them and telling them and telling them not just that we love them but telling what we appreciate about them and and some of you are really really good at affirming your, you know each other and affirming others and affirming your spouse and telling them what they're doing right and that they look great and that they're you know they did this well and man you're so good at this and this is just a natural love language the second one is, is quality time. Quality time, which we're going to get into today, quality time is different than quantity time. A lot of times when I g grew up in church, I, I, everything that was taught about our relationship with God was, was really the pressure put on us was to spend quantity time with God. That I, I always walked away feeling like I wasn't spending enough time with him, that I should be praying more and longer, that I should be reading the Bible more and, and, and longer, and devotion time should be longer, and that the longer that you could do devotion time, the more spiritual you got. That's, the, that's what I felt anyway. And, and so then, <laughs> but that, this is different. This is not quantity time. This is quality time. And we're going to, the same thing with, with our, our relationships, that you know, quantity time is, yeah, we can go to a movie, and we, we had a date night, and we went to a movie, and we spent, you know, two, three hours together, but two of those hours watching a movie was just sitting there staring at a screen. That's not quality time. That's quantity time. We spent time together, but we didn't do any discussing, okay? That's, the third love language is physical touch. Physical touch is in relationships, and especially in it, you know, marriage relationships is a lot more than just sexual. It's it's something that is you know those you know those those of you out there that are huggy. You can tell by my facial expressions that this is not me. I'll hug you. I, I like I I do like hugs, but 
that's not something I'm going to seek or need or crave. And, you know, my, my second oldest, I picked on all of my kids so far. So I'm, Kale said, Dad, you haven't talked about me. So I'm going to talk about <laughs> Kale. Kale the other day is like, he knows that my physical, my, my love language is not physical touch. So he saw me sitting on the couch. I don't know, I was reading a book or, or something like that. And he sat down, he's like, Dad. And he, he leans in uncomfortably close and puts his leg over top of my legs, pulls me in there and kisses me on the cheek, puts his, his scruffy face up against mine. He's like, Dad. And I'm like, no. <laughs> That's not right. That's, some of you would like that. It's not my language. It's all good. Fourth love language is gifts. Okay, this is not, this is not again, the, the amount of the gift or the, the price of the gift. This is all about, this is all about the idea and, and just being thoughtful and giving gifts and whether they're handmade or crafted or, or self-made or whether you bought them. or you, It's just the thought that counts and people just love receiving gifts. And, and I know this is, this is uh, Pastor Heidi's in, in Claire's home. This is one of her love languages and her gift is actually, it's a little bit more, it's more, Focus. She was my personal assistant for a long time, and I learned that her love language was Reese's Pieces. She just loved, she, so just everyone at Claire's home, you're welcome. Um, and Heidi didn't pay me to put me up with that, but you're welcome, Heidi. Anyway, so, <laughs> gifts. Then there's the fifth one is acts of service, which is, you know, doing something for somebody else that, they, you know, that's just above and beyond and helping them with, with, with things and helping them, you know, get things done, or how, doing something just above and beyond. These are the five love languages. Now, every single one of us has a, a, a predominant language that we speak, okay? And uh, this predominant language that we speak is typically what we like to receive because it's our language and we can understand it. But the problem is when, when we get married is that we marry somebody that usually is opposite or speaks a different language. And so what often happens in our, in our marriages and our relationships is that we're speaking one language and they're speaking another one and then you end up in counseling and going, I don't think my spouse loves me anymore. And it's, it's like going, what are you talking about? I've been speaking this language to you. Or I've been giving you this language. Or I've been, I've been serving you. I've been doing all these things. And they're going, well, no, I haven't been told. Or I ha you didn't give me any gifts. Or you missed my birthday. For goodness sakes. Like, I mean, all of a sudden it's like, you don't love me anymore. And we miss these languages. Which got me to thinking in Genesis chapter 5, it says in verse 1 that God made mankind, all of us, in his image. And that each, if each one of us has a language in which we communicate love, then I'm thinking, at one of the five, I'm thinking that God, who made all of us in his image, must have all five. So I went searching all throughout the scriptures and looking for, does God receive love differently than we sometimes assume? Because all of us, We'll, we, you know, we think we're loving God. We think we're having a relationship with God. And we think we're communicating with him. But if he's, if he's, if he's not receiving at the same level that we're, we're giving, there's going to be a miss. And I don't know about you, but I want to connect with God on a whole other level. Because it's just, life just goes a whole lot better. And I believe, see, this is, some of you might be surprised by that, that statement. Some of you might think that this is church and this is you know, religion and this is just a system of beliefs. But we don't, we don't gather at My Victory Church for religion. In fact, we, we hate religion because Jesus hated religion. We don't gather for religion or for practices or a system of beliefs. We gather for relationship with God. And this series is about how can we individually connect in relationship deeper with him. That's what we want. Today I want to talk about quality time. And I, I remember, I, I've been wrestling with this one my entire life, just to let you know. I'm a pastor. This is what I do for a living. I spend all of my time in church. So you would assume, you would think, that because I'm a pastor, all I do, I, I just work one day a week. Now too, that we have... Saturday services, and the rest of the week, I just get to spend time with God, and that's easy for me to connect with God, 
It's not any easier for me or any of us pastors to connect with God than it is for, for, for any of you. We don't have some secret hotline, some secret code. We, you know, God doesn't speak to us more clearly than anybody else. And to be quite honest, this is a personal struggle and has been my entire life. And the reason being is because of what I began talking about is, is this, this guilt trip that was always put on me as a kid, that I wasn't spending enough time and I wasn't doing the right things the right way. And so I was having so much difficulty connecting with God. And I felt so guilty that actually devotions and spending time with God became a chore. It wasn't refreshing at all. It wasn't doing anything. And it just became exhausting and a chore. It's not meant to be that way. And I remember it kind of the, the crux of this whole time as I went to a pastor's conference one time. And at this pastor's conference, uh, a pastor got up there and he started talking about, waxing eloquently about his relationship with God. And he, he started talking about how every single day he would wake up at like 4 a.m. and spend at least four to six hours a day praying. And this is why his church was growing. And I sat there and I felt about this tall. Because I'm thinking, four hours? Four, four hours. I was like, this guy, wow, he knows God. And I was like, I felt like, who am I to pastor? I had four hours, 4 a.m. My first thought was, is Jesus even awake then? <laughs> so I thought, I thought, okay. This is how he church, his church is growing. This is what pastors do. So I woke up early, and I began praying. And I, I, got, I got there, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock. I'm gonna, I, this, is, this is how you get close to God. And so I went to my office and put on worship music. And I started, I read, you know, I read a couple passages in the Bible. And then I started praying. And I was praying. And I started pacing back and forth and praying. And I prayed everything that I could think of and even things that I had never thought of before. I listed it all. And I prayed it all. Everything, every person I'd ever met. And I prayed for for every individual in my church. I prayed for every family member. I started, when I ran out of family members, I prayed for distant family members. And I just, I, I went on and on and I just prayed and prayed and I prayed for, for distant family members who were friends with their neighbors. And I prayed for everybody. And I thought, man, I am, I'm waxing out. I'm doing great. And I thought, I've been, I've been at this thing that I could do this four hour thing. And I looked up at the clock and I, you know, did the eye, you look up there, 15 minutes. I have a small family. Now, if I hadn't met Jorlin before, no, I'm just kidding. Prayed for her family, it would have taken the whole four hours. But <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah, so I thought, okay, I got to slow this down a bit. So what I, I looked at, I, man, I, I brought out a map, and I thought, I'm going to pray for every nation individually. Ones I could pronounce and ones I couldn't pronounce. God, you know. But <laughs> this stand. <laughs> that nation. And I prayed for, I prayed for everything. And man, I could for four hours. And then you start repeating. I was exhausted. I was frustrated. I was like, how? I what? And then I felt worse. I felt like I'm not, this guy's spiritual. Whew. Anybody else? And when we talk about devotion time, maybe, maybe you're new to this and thinking, <laughs> you're talking about how to connect with God? You, you can connect with God? There's a way to connect with God? How, how, can we do this? Yeah. But it's not about quantity time. It's about quality time. And this guilt that we all carry around, like somehow we're supposed to... You ever, I mean, if, if you haven't tried this praying thing for a long time. Maybe you've been in small groups or you've been around, you know, a volunteer meeting and you hear somebody start to pray in the volunteer meeting and you're sitting there and going, I hope they don't ask me to pray because I can't pray like them. And I don't know the right things to say. And I certainly hope they don't ask me to pray out loud because I, I can't pray like that. I mean, you hear me pray up here and you're thinking, I can't pray. I can't pray like that. <laughs> I, I couldn't do that. And so then all of a sudden you're feeling That you're somehow less spiritual or less connected. And you're going, oh man, 
Listen, Jesus spoke about this. He talked about this. He addressed this very thing because his disciples were humble fishermen and tax collectors. And they watched, they, they actually started commenting on the Pharisees who would wax eloquently and pray in public and pray on the street corners. And they're like, oh, we can't do that. And so they said to Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And you might be surprised how Jesus taught us how to connect with him. You might be shocked. I was shocked. Matthew chapter 6, he's teaching his disciples how to pray. And this is what he said. He said, when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. So when you come before God, don't turn it into a theatrical, what's a theatrical production? A theatrical production is something that you rehearse, that you have certain lines that you're supposed to say and you're supposed to deliver and you're supposed to say it a certain tone, you're supposed to, you're supposed to, you're, you're acting. And some, and when Jesus says, when you come to, to him in prayer, he says, don't turn that into a theatrical production. Because some of us, this is what I, I, I grew up in church, and I heard people pray, and people would be talking just like I'm talking now, and then all of a sudden, they would go into prayer, and their language would change, their tone of voice would change, and all of a sudden, their voice would drop two octaves, and they'd be like, dear Father, <laughs> dear Father in heaven, we come, you know, and, and all of a sudden, they would start saying Th these and thous and ests and th th just, and all, I mean, all these kind of things would start going on. Everything would change. And I was like, well, that's how we're supposed to pray. Like we're supposed to start with our Father. Or if you haven't, if you haven't done this, <laughs> oh man, I'm going to step on a lot of toes tonight, today. That's, is that okay? Is, <laughs> because we, you're thinking, oh, I, I don't turn it into theological production. The only way I was told how to pray was with my hands folded, my head bowed, and my eyes closed. That God could only hear me if my head was at a certain angle. My eyes were closed, no peeking, because God would stop listening immediately, and my hands. And if I was wearing a hat, Pastor Kelly went there. Okay. But suddenly God could stop hearing. I mean, he couldn't get past. The voice, our voice couldn't carry beyond the brim. So we'd pray and we'd be respect and heads bowed, eyes closed. We do this, don't we? We take a posture of prayer. We take a language of prayer. And suddenly, suddenly, it becomes a production. Jesus said, don't do that. Because why? This is not about us. Quality time is not one-sided. Have, have you ever met somebody and they did all the talking? If you're married to that person, just straight ahead. <laughs> you like that when you went on the first date because they did all the talking. You didn't even have to do any effort. That was, all, that was perfect. And you're like, this is awesome. I love this. This is great. And then after a while, it became annoying. <laughs> if, you're, if you had a relationship with somebody and they did all the talking, let me ask you a question. Is that quality time? This is, how, this is what I did. I would, I would get before God, and I thought in the four hours of spending time with God that I was supposed to do all the talking. And I was supposed to talk the entire four hours thinking that that was quality time. Jesus goes on, he says this. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom, do you think God sits in a box seat? As soon as the Message Bible said this, I thought of the two guys in the Muppets. <laughs> I just dated myself now. You, you know the two guys, right? The two guys, the, the Muppets, Muppets like, like, that was the worst thing I've ever heard. That was, that, was the, that was the worst thing. And then all of a sudden, well, it wasn't that bad. I like this part. Oh, yeah, that's right. I like that part too. And then all of a sudden, it's, that was the best thing I ever heard. That was amazing. You remember those guys? I mean, yeah. 
That God's in, God's in this box seat and he's judging us on our performance. And we, 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 don't, we don't say it, but you've been in those meetings where you've heard somebody wax eloquently in prayer and you've thought, I can't do that and maybe God must be impressed. Jesus is like, and do you think God's up there judging? <laughs> that was a 10 prayer. That was, that was a three. <laughs> and he goes on. Here's what I want you to do. This is what Jesus says. Okay, don't do that. This is what I want you to do. Find a quiet, seclu secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly, as you can manage, because all of us, as you can manage, I like that, because all of us have this, what we can manage, and we still, I still, man, I grew up in this thing, I still, I'm teaching this stuff, and I'm convicted, personally, because I still have some role play that I can't shake, because I can't think, this is how I've connected, with, I can't think I can connect with God any other way than, than saying the right things and doing the right things. and have, He says, no, find a quiet, secluded place. Just you and God. Because this is not about a production. This is about a relationship. And he wants quality time with you. With you. So this is what I've, this is a few things that I've learned how to do. This is some things that I had to shake off some of these, these things. Find a quiet place. Early morning, late at night, where there's no distractions as, as much as you can do that. But I have a very, very active brain. And my brain just doesn't shut off. And so when I try to meet with God, I'm thinking about a hundred different things at the same time. I'm thinking about, if I, in the early morning, I'm thinking about all the things I got to do today. I'm thinking about, oh, I wonder how come that person was mad at me yesterday and how come this happened there? And man, this, did, what did this person mean? What's going on here? I, should, I haven't talked to that person for a while. And all of a sudden, I just, you, just, you start to pray and your mind just goes. Pfft. So I learned just a simple little thing. I learned in order to control my own brain, I have a notepad or, or, or a pad of paper or something beside me. And I'll just write down what I'm thinking about. Call so-and-so, you know, look on, you know, remember this today or whatever. And I'll just write it down to try to get it off of there so that I can refocus. And it takes me time to refocus. I also find this is just in order for my brain to work and not, maybe you're different than, than mine, but in order for, for me to work, I have to find, I, I found, I have a chair that I go to that is a chair where if I can sit in this, it's one chair, it's, it's a, a specific spot that if I go and sit in that chair, it's, I, can, I can just say, no, no, no this, is, this is time now where just shut up brain and listen. In a secluded place. And then hopefully in that routine, the focus, your focus will shift and you'll quiet your mind. Because look what happens if you find a quiet and secluded place. This is what Jesus said. Here's what's going to happen. The focus will shift from you and all the things you got going on to God. And then, then, when that happens, you'll begin to sense his grace, his unmerited favor. And you'll be able to sense his presence. Can you imagine? You start to sense him. You get this feeling that, he likes me. He wants to connect with me. He wants relationship. That I, even though I messed up yesterday, even though this went on, even though this went wrong, he just, he, he, I'm okay. He and I are okay. And you'll sense when you, when you, you get off of yourself and all of those things, you begin, all of a sudden you begin to sense him. And when you stop and pull away and you begin to sit honestly with God, that's when you feel him. And then Jesus wasn't done. He said this, the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. Interesting comment. Because I grew up thinking that effective prayer was based on a certain technique. And I marveled at people who could powerfully pray. In fact, I was intimidated by them.
But these prayer ignorant so-called prayer warriors who found the formula, Jesus said they're full of formulas and programs and advice and peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. Why? Because prayer is not about a shopping list. About what you want from God. Can you imagine the relationship you'd have with your kids if the only thing they talked to you about was what they wanted? If every time they had a conversation with you, they came with a shopping list. Um, I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. Okay. Bye. If that was the only time, eventually the relationship dries up. Yet our prayer is, is, has become, mine did, became that the only thing I went to God for, the only time I prayed to God was when I had a need. The only time I talked to God was when I had a list of things that I wanted him to do or expected him to do. And Jesus says, don't fall for that nonsense. Because this is why. This is your father you're dealing with. And he knows better than you what you need. In other words, Jesus brought it back to relationship. This is your daddy. This is your father. He knows what you need. You don't need to list all the things you need. You can, yeah, you can, well, what about it when it says you're supposed to ask him and you know you have not because you asked not? Okay, you know, ask. But listen, ask once and say, God, this is on my heart. This is, I'm just honestly coming before you. This is on my heart. And, and this would be not, I like this, but God, I, it's not the purpose for me getting together with God. The purpose of me getting together with God is God, I just, I just want you. I just want relationship with you. And if I, could, if I could put all the pretenses away and all the formulas away and all of the, the right dress code, the right posture, and if I could pray unceasingly with him, connect with him and saying, God, I... something happened when I was about 20 years old and I had all these formulas and I was on tour with, with this band and one of the guys in the band, we did this little pre-gig prayer thing and also in one of the the guys in the band said, uh, said uh, hey, hey, man, it's me. And he just started talking to God like he was like right standing in front of him and just this friend. And I, I thought, I was like, no, no you're, you're supposed to say our father or you're supposed to say dear Lord or like, no, you don't address him like, like that. But yet at the same time I'm going, that's wrong because it didn't match all my formulas. But at the same time I walked away and I was like, but there was intimacy there. There was relationship there. And I crave that. And that's what quality time with God is. Let's, let's put aside this week, let's put aside all of these formulas, all of these things, and just go to God and say, hey, it's, it's me. I want to talk. Many you sit there and have this conversation. Sometimes in this conversation, it's two-sided. And that notepad beside the bed, not only does it get off the stuff off my chest, but you know what else it does? Is all of a sudden, I'll just begin to sense some things. And things start coming up, and I just start writing down what I sense. And all of a sudden, you look back and read it, and you're realizing, I think God is talking to me. Because I wouldn't have naturally thought of that. It's all about relationship. Today's takeaway is this. Quality time with God isn't about him. Isn't about me. Quality time with God is not about me. And what I can get from him. Sometimes I just need to shut up and listen. And God wants that relationship. We provided for you a U version reading plan saying, I don't know what to read in the Bible, how to do that, but how do I connect with God? We, we've, there's a U version Bible plan that we're going to connect with you guys all, all across all of our campuses this week. It's all about this relationship and how to do this. And, and I encourage you, the devotional books that we've written, the reason why I've written devotional books is to help you to connect with 
with God in some way, just make it easy and just connect. But I, I don't know about you. I want to go deeper with him. Relationship. Take all the pressure of the amount of time. I want quality time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We just want you. God, we invite you now into this place. We want a touch of heaven. We want to connect with you. And I pray that for those here and across all of our campuses that have never felt a connection with you, that this week there'd be a breakthrough. That we'd be able to connect with you and have quality time with you and hear you, hear your voice and have real relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.